Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Goha Thakurta, and with me here in the studio, I have Palagumi Sainath. He really needs no introduction. A senior journalist, a MagSessay Award winner, an activist, and currently very, very concerned about the agrarian crisis in the country. And he is one of the persons engaged in trying to put together this long march of farmers, farm workers, the dispossessed sections of Indian society to converge onto the national capital at the end of November. In the first part of this discussion I have with him, we are going to look at the agrarian crisis. Sainath, you say that India's agrarian crisis has gone beyond the agrarian. That's what you've written. You said it's an entire crisis of our society, perhaps even a civilizational crisis. I mean, why, why, do, you, why do you make this statement? It's in fact uh, not just about the loss of production, not just about the loss of lives, it's also about the loss of our own humanity. We've sat by quite comfortably for 20 years, during which 3 lakh 10,000 farmers have taken their own lives in suicide. There has got to be something very wrong with us to be able to, you know, act as if the world is perfectly normal and things go on normally. The crisis is also way beyond the agrarian because every other section, all other sections of society are being affected by it. Within agrarian itself, what do we mean? It means it's not just a farming crisis, but a crisis of the larger agrarian society. Their livelihoods, are their, their, and, and also it's linked to what's happening in urban India, correct? Pretty much. Also, you've seen the biggest migrations in our history. Um, the 2011 census hints as much. For the first time, urban India added more human beings to its population than uh, rural India did to its population. And, and you believe this has a lot to do with loss of livelihoods, distress, farm dis distress in, in agriculture? It's not just a question of what I believe. It's also the fact that if you look between the 91 census and the 2011 census, 15 million farmers have dropped out. Okay? The number of farmers in 2011 census is 15 million fewer than they were in 1991, which means that they've been dropping out at the rate of more than 2,000 a day. Every 24 hours, there are 2,000 fewer farmers. First 10 years, 91 to 2001, 7.2 million fewer farmers. Second 10 years till 2011, 7.7 .7 million fewer farmers. That's about 15 million or 14.9 million. So when, where do they go? One, it's not that, <clears throat> well, some of them have moved to the cities, some of them have moved. Migrations is not just about going to the cities. There is village to village migration, rural to rural, rural to urban, urban to urban, a tiny element of urban to rural. And, it's, and then there is the footloose migration where people are just going about looking anywhere where they can get work for 10 days, 20 days a month. So that kind of complete insecurity has come into many of the agrarian classes. But where have the bulk of the farmers gone? In the census abstract, primary census abstract on agriculture, you just have to look at the next column. As the numbers of farmers declines dramatically, the numbers of agricultural laborers is exploding. Which means that today, many of the agricultural laborers of today were yesterday's farmers. That's a gigantic crisis. Okay? That's a huge crisis. And, and you, when you say that farming has perhaps the, become the most risky profession in this country, I mean far more than playing the stock markets or gambling, that it has become that the very section of our society that is responsible for providing you food is engaged in the riskiest of all professions. And you are saying the, the, the entire scale of the crisis, the magna magnitude of the crisis is being covered up today because the government's National Crime Records Bureau 
is not publishing data pertaining to suicides of farmers for, la for the last two years or thereabouts. And you also allege that the data that has been put out in the public domain is being manipulated. You've gone to the extent of calling it fraudulent because certain states like Chhattisgarh and West Bengal have claimed that there have been no suicides by farmers. Why don't you elaborate on this point a little more? Well, okay, first of all, the National Crime Records Bureau was a division of the Union Home Ministry. Its data, the NCRB and its statisticians and its um, monitors, they themselves have done no harm to the data. They have not fiddled the data. They have not... The data that they were publishing was the closest we have to authentic, but it has lots of problems because it reflects our social biases and prejudice. Okay, when a policeman goes out to a village to look at a suicide, you know, if it's an Adivasi or a Dalit farmer or a, you know, who doesn't have a patta, he won't record him as a farmer, just as a suicide. If it's a woman, nine times out of ten, they will record it as a woman's suicide, not as a farmer's suicide, because socially we are... We find it very difficult to accept women as farmers. And, and that there's actually been a large-scale feminization of Indian agriculture where women have been playing a increasingly yeah. greater role in, in farming. Increasingly greater burden because where the migrations out of the profession by men meant that means that women who were earlier doing livestock, dairying, and anyway doing the bulk of work, you know, uh, are now pushed more and more into crop agriculture as well, where they are facing new sets of problems. So you're, you have um, women excluded very big time. But this was not done by the NCRB. That is the data coming from the police stations reflecting our social prejudices. So it was always the NCRB's figures, which begin in 1995 for farm data, were always huge underestimates. But from 2011, as the farm suicides issue became a big political, you know, uh, football or explore, explosive, one state after the other started declaring zero suicides. In fact, in 2014, 12 states and six union territories That's claimed right. there were zero suicides. Yes. And in 2014 and 15, the NCRB numbers saw, according to you, they've manipulated the data. You, the okay. word, <laughs> what you use is fiddles in method, methodology. Well, my, 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 my words were, they're hiding corpses in other columns. Now, what happens is this. In the 2014 report, they changed the methodology, which the NCRB had followed for 20 years, in 19 years, and in the 20th year, they changed the methodology. So the 2014 report, which comes out in uh, 2014 data, which comes out in 2015, they break farmers into different categories: farmers, agricultural laborers, tenant farmers. Now, knowing fully well that 95% of tenancies in the country are unrecorded, so what's going to happen is that the policeman who is checking, he is going to record that guy as an agricultural laborer. So that year the number of agricultural labor suicides was far higher than the number of farmer suicides because you've shifted a number of tenant farmers into that column. right? Then, even then the figures were looking so bad, so they started burying corpses in, new, in other columns. Now, in all these accounting columns, you have a final one called others. And you see those numbers going up. <laughs> they weren't going up. They were going through the roof. So Karnataka had a 60% fall in farm suicides that year and a 245% increase in suicides by others. The five major states that accounted for 70% of farmers' suicides. These are? At that time, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana were one. Hmm? Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, um, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, the uh, MP, these, these states accounted for more than two-thirds of the farmers' suicides. In 1995, when the collection of data started on this, they accounted for 52%. Today, they account for more than 70% of the farmers' suicides. Okay, so in those areas of high stress, it's been exploding. Now, these five states, 
saw a fall of more than 50% in farmer suicides and an increase in the others column of 128%. So that, that is to substantiate your point that they're, fraud. they're fudging. All right. Now, what we are seeing in different parts of the country, including some of the states that we've talked about, farmers, farm workers have been protesting. We know farmers have been shot dead in Mansoor in Madhya Pradesh. We are seeing in other parts, farmers protesting in different ways including in Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, their produce is being dumped on the streets. Milk is flowing on the streets. Tomatoes are flowing on the streets. Yet, we see the government seems to be, you know, trying to at best applying Band-Aid to problems which are very, very deep-seated. And, and, and we, we'll talk a little bit after that on two or three issues. Manrega is one of them. And, and this whole thing about the minimum support price and the Swaminathan Commission. But yes, the, please. But the... It's actually trying to, it's trying to apply a band-aid to a hole in the heart. That's what, that's what they're trying to do. The thing is also, please, I, I, I forgot to mention, but you, you did. By 2014, 12 states and six union territories were declaring zero suicides, and yet the numbers were showing not a decrease. Yeah. Bengal for five years, Chhattisgarh for five years, these were states that had annual averages of 800 in Bengal and annual averages of 1,500 in Chhattisgarh. Suddenly they go to zero. You know, who can believe this? You cannot, it's simply not physically possible. So that's one thought. Yes, farmers have been protesting increasingly. And for me, that is a very positive thing. What I looked at over 20 years of covering the 20 years of covering their crisis is serious, deep-rooted demoralization, which is a recipe for suicide, among other things. Okay, So in the last two, three years, you're seeing them stand up, fight, protest, come out onto the streets. They know they've been cheated. They're pro you know, so yes, you saw the Mandasaur firing. You saw a lot of things. You, you see everywhere in the country there is unrest amongst the farmers. The thing is that they, they, they've now decided to move from, I mean, it, it seems to me that they've decided to move to active protest okay. than passive demoralization. Okay, we'll, we'll come, we're going to come to that in a little while from now. But you argue, and you're not the only person, people like John Dries and others have pointed out, how the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, which is one time touted as if it, it's the world's largest social security program. Whether it be farmers, whether it be farm workers, whether it be fish of people, whether it be forest dwellers, whether it be artisans, whether it be workers in Anganwadis, school teachers, employees in you know, government house, all of them are, at some point of time, they thought that the, this scheme would help them. But here you see the government systematically trying to, what should I say, not just undermine, but bury it. Yeah, destroy it altogether. That started, to, to be fair, that process started several years ago before Mr. Jaitley and the NDA as well. It had before started. Before Mr. Modi came to power. Yeah, it started even when Mr. Chidambaram started undermining the NREGS. Hmm? So there was always, see, the NREGS was something that I think the Manmohan government did reluctantly under pressure from their own leader and also under pressure from 64 left MPs in parliament. This was something that they did reluctantly. Maybe some of the top Congress leaders were very much for it. But I don't believe that Mr. Manmohan Singh and Mr. Chidambaram loved that program. So you saw the undermining of the NREGS in various ways. And in Maharashtra, for instance, Mr. Sharad Pawar saw to it that it couldn't take off. You had eight districts that were at one time reporting zero performance. Zero. No, no, days. It's been well documented that even if the government claims that they're spending the maximum amount of money, this money is not released. There are huge backlogs, six months. Yeah. Wages yes. not being paid. And, and in the last four years, do you, and the four and a half years, especially since the Narendra Modi government came to power, do you see this particular program having been further uh, undermined and weakened? Incredibly much further 
undermined and weakened. The classic example for you is in the first year of the Modi government. They slash the NREGS funds of the best performing state in the country, Tripura. Tripura was, by, not by their claim, but by the central government's own acknowledgement and the Rural Development Ministry's acknowledgement, Tripura was the best performing state in the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. And in Tripura, the NREGA had gone much further than just stopping hunger. People were able to send their kids to little extra tuition. It was having an impact on education of children. Okay? Uh, unlike, say, in some parts of Andhra, where it was really a business of keeping the agricultural laborer alive. You cut 53% of Tripura's funds and double the allocation for Gujarat, where it's all going to be done by machines. It's all going to be done by, it's, it's not going to be done by uh, manual uh, work. It's not going to be done that way. So there was, it wasn't an accident. It was clear policy that we will finish this program. Okay. However, this government, whenever it has been accused of not doing enough for agriculture, the agrarian sector, the rural sector, they've come back and said, no, no. Our programs will ensure that farm, in, farmers' incomes would be doubled by 2022. And most recently, the government has talked about, quote unquote, the biggest ever hike in the minimum support price. And then they're talking about the Swaminathan Commission and the National Commission of Farmers and how they have sought to increase these farmers. Now, why? I mean, you have consistently argued that the Swaminathan Committee's reports, which have been there for the last 14 years, years uh, mm -hmm. sorry, 12 years, I stand corrected, has not been implemented. I mean, why, the, why this, and even this government is making a claim that it's implementing the Swaminathan Commission's reports, but it's not. Okay. Well, you're right, actually, 14 years, because the first of the Swaminathan Commission reports was submitted in December 2004. The last, if I remember rightly, 2006 October. Hmm. So over 18, over 14 years. There has never been a discussion called on the reports as such for the entire parliament to debate. I think 14 years is plenty of time. Now, second thing is that about the government and its claims, this government and its claims of implementing and not implementing. Firstly, the Swaminathan Commission's report, which is more accurately described as the National Commission for Farmers report, there were other people in it, was about a lot more than just MSP. Correct. Okay. And there are more than just the calculation of cost of production yeah. plus 50% plus yeah. amortization, interest, depreciation, etc., etc. Right. Et the various right. ways of calculating that. That's exactly number. right. So, but, but, I mean, you had, you have giant ideas which are still to be even looked at. Price stabilization fund, you know, the new credit systems, all these sort of things are there in the Swami Extension Nadekan. programs. Extension programs. But look at this government. 2014, it came to power on a promise of implementing the first of the Swaminathan Commission's main recommendations, which was a minimum support price equal to cost of production, COP2, plus 50%. Now, this was 2014. 2015, the government submitted an affidavit in the courts and an RTI reply. This cannot be done. The government that came to power on the promise said it cannot be done. It would lead to a distortion of the markets. So they were worried about the distortion of the poor market, not about the distortions of millions of human beings who were farmers. In 2016, Radha Mohan Singh, the current agriculture, agriculture min minister, agriculture minister claimed that no such promise had ever been made. In 2017, they said, what Swaminathan? Madhya Pradesh has gone much further than, much further than Swaminathan Commission. Look at how Shivraj Chawan is doing. And we saw how he was doing with the Mansour firing and the killing of five farmers. 2018, budget speech by Mr. Arun Jaitley. I draw your attention to paragraphs 13 and 14 of the budget speech. Jaitley acknowledges that such a promise was made and then claims not only did we make this promise, we have implemented it. In the Karif crop, it's already been implemented. The MSP of cost of production plus 50%. July, Mr. Modi and others say 
we are going to implement the uh, MSP of com, uh, cost of production plus 50 percent. Now, they've made five different positions in as many in four years. Now, what is this MSP stuff about? People get confused about it. I get hundreds of emails asking me about it. There were various ways of calculating MSP, not just three. There was A1, A2, C1, but there were three that mattered, which people were using at one level or the other. One was A2, which is purely the input cost, the paid out cost of the farmer in a season. Two was A2 plus FL, which is the input cost plus imputed family, fam labor. family labor cost. Third was what the Swaminathan Commission had actually asked for, which was cost of COP2, comprehensive cost of production, which would include rental value of land, debt. Which the government is saying we can't give. Effectively, without in, not which, in so many words. Which, by the way, no enterprise in the world functions without calculating those. Can you name an enterprise any business enterprise that functions without taking these calculations into account. Now to give you what is the difference for a lay reader or lay viewer, the cheapest variety of wheat when these announcements came, the cheapest variety of wheat, if you took it at A2 value, the cost of production was 500, which means MSP would be 750. A2 plus FL cost of production was 800. MSP would be 1250. But COP2 was 1200. The comprehensive cost of production of that cheapest variety of wheat was 1200 per quintal, which means your MSP would be 1800. Now, between 750 and 1800, or even 1200 and 1800, it's, it's a more hell than of, double that amount. It's, it's a huge sum of money. Right. And that was the cheating that they were doing. Most of the products were under A2. Okay. A few had A2 plus FL. All right. Sainath, you have been actively engaged in trying to mobilize support from various sections. And I understand over 200 organizations have come together uh, to have this march to the national capital in late November. In March of 2018, a lot of people were taken aback when 40,000 Farmers, forest dwellers, Adivasis, the underprivileged section walked for seven days from Nashik to Mumbai in the peak of summer and came to Mumbai. Now you think, I mean, yes, we'll talk about how the media described them, yeah. but, but you want to now have an even bigger march of people in Delhi. Paranjoy, there's a <coughs> very big... Uh Misunderstanding here, this is not my march. No, I know it's not yours. It's not my march. I am trying to see how middle class professionals like you and I can make ourselves relevant to and worthy of the call of 201 farmers organizations that made a call for a march on July 14th this year, a couple of weeks before that, the largest body, the All India Kisan Sabha, had made a call. But the 201 farmers' organizations banded under the All India Kisan Sangarsh Samiti Coordination um, uh, Committee, made this call. And I felt that we have to respond to the AIKSCC call for a big march. Uh, it is the call of the Sangarsh Samiti Coordination Committee, the Kisan Sangarsh Coordination Committee, their call to which people like us feel that we should respond. The, the idea of it and the credit of it actually goes, goes to them. No, I, and, I, I, no, and also goes to the 40,000 farmers you mentioned who showed us that the world was somewhat different today than what we had come to believe it right. was. And, and they walked at night so that the, the children who would have to appear for their school examinations would not be disturbed. Be disturbed. And, and you saw even in the city like Mumbai where uh, uh, large sections of the middle class came out in support, gave them food, yeah. gave them water, etc., etc. But 
It was a spectacular thing. But, that, but, but, but. Okay. Where, where, from there, where are we? Yeah. The question is, Fadnavis, the, the chief minister of, of Maharashtra said, yes, yes, we will look into their demands and they were uh, sought Please. to sort of diffuse the Of course entire. they will try doing that. But that's why we have a larger march at the national level. Because so many of the issues concern the center. Now, but here, but I have to tell you this, when you say, what did it achieve? I think it achieved something fantastic. Hmm. Remember, when that march began, the AIKS march began from Nashik to Mumbai. I believe in Nashik, there were about 12,000. They reached Mumbai, they've got 50,000 in that, in the, in the Azad Maidan. People joined them all along the way in Nashik and Thane. When they're coming up the Kasara Ghat, it's a spectacular sight of 40,000 people winding up a mountain. Okay? And what did they do? First, they showed us that it can be done. These are people who, don't, who are so poor, they don't own footwear. They came with their feet cut and bleeding. And the old women, and many of them, prevent, staunched the bleeding of their feet by sellotaping their feet. They were too poor to afford chapels, so they put sellotape. Activists of the Kisan Sabha gave them rolls of sellotape and they put those around their feet and marched in 38 degrees overhead heat, two degrees plus coming from the highway, and they came to Mumbai. In Mumbai, they were exhausted, but they decided, as you said, to march at night and in silence without raising slogans. They didn't want to disturb the lakhs of children who would appear for their board exams. And I think that triggered a wave of gratitude and respect in the middle classes of Mumbai, who came out, people came and gave a thousand pairs of free chapels. People came out with food packets, with water packets, I have not seen that in 35 okay. years. Okay. Now, now let's try and see what's going to could but happen. But no, one, one okay. moment. One Please moment. Go on. The thing is, when it started, the cabinet ministers of the Fadanavis government said, we will not talk to these people. Who are they? They're not farmers. They're urban mouse. When they arrived with 50,000 people, they came in on 90% of their demands in four hours. Okay. The, the fact is that these guys showed us that sometimes you just got to go yourself and get it done. Okay. That's what they showed us. Third, third, they showed us that they could reach out to sections like the middle classes, to the students. These are the things they showed us. I think the achievement was considerable. Right. So, so you're hopeful that this march that is being planned for the toward the last few days of November would be able to scale up. Uh, there would be more people. I understand the government of Delhi has given you support. But you should, are you prepared for how the government is going to be uh, so, sort of... Government uh, of Delhi has given the March support. Right, wait. What the central government or the union government would do? Your plans of uh, surrounding parliament, there'll be section 144 there. Your, your plans of saying we'll have a special session of parliament to discuss the farmers' issue. The government is not possibly not going to give a damn or, or, or to say we, we do do it. No, but once again, we've had protests by farmers in Delhi. We've had farmers from Tamil Nadu displaying skulls in Jantar Mantar. Tell me this so-called Occupy Delhi March. I'm being cynical. You are. I am. Mm. To ask you how you think, what impact it could possibly have. I think you were yourself present at a meeting where a network of middle class professionals on a Sunday 35, 50, on, on, on a holiday, on, on a, a holiday, day. on a holiday, 35, 50 people were contacted, 200 people showed up. Yeah, really enthusiastic and many of, some of them included veteran activists who have been part of many marches, who know what's possible and what's not possible. That's one Including thing. Including people like Ms. Damle, who was uh, uh, moving force behind the, uh, the Maharashtra. Uh, Davle. Uh, Mr. I, Davle. I, I, sorry, I stand. Yeah. Davle, yes. Yeah, so he was the moving, one of the big organizers of the Nashik to Mumbai march. There too, I was not an organizer. People's Archive of Rural India played a role in that we were, from the first hour, putting out information about the march, which the Marathi press then picked up from us in a very big way. But the farmers scored the victory by getting a video of themselves coming up the Kasara Ghat and sending it out on WhatsApp 
and that went viral and it went berserk on Marathi television. And the same media that had virtually ignored the march was forced. I was getting 90 calls a day from media people asking, there were guys asking me, can you sum up in a few sound bites uh, <laughs> the complex issues of two decades? Okay, but they made the, they made the deaf hear. They made the blind see. Don't underestimate these people. About the Modi government and its... Of course, I'm very sure they might try it. But on the other hand, they may not. Because one of the things is, we're asking all members of parliament, the marchers are asking all members of parliament who agree with their demands, and there are many, to come and join them in the march to Delhi. So they, they, they should be escorted by members of parliament to parliament. Second, this is the most democratic protest. What are people saying? They're saying, we want our parliament to function. The, the representatives are telling the representatives, we want you to function. We want you to come and join this march. We want you to escort us to parliament. We want to sit there. Third, you're asking for a special session of parliament. Again, a democratic demand. Third, fourth, you're saying it's on that focus of that session should be on the agrarian crisis and related issues, issues beyond MSP. Now, one of the things is government will accept MSP. They will say 5,000 rupees per quintal tomorrow. They will never implement it because they will not procure. If there's no procurement system outside of Punjab, there hardly exists one anymore. If there's no procurement, I can offer you 10,000 rupees. The second thing they do is they will open the procurement centers 10 days late. In which case, you as a farmer... For your, for your in, in this, on this occasion, the MSP announcement would, took place well after sowing had begun. Correct. It should have been announced one month earlier. Correct. It, it won, the, the government really wanted Correct. to have an impact. And then they'll open the procurement centers 10 okay. days late and they'll close them five days early. So both ends of the harvest, both ends of the arrivals, farmers are forced to sell off at lower rates. So all these problems, you do expect. You know, when you undertake any activity of protest, you do expect. But... The farmers and laborers in this march are making their protest in, within the highest standards of democratic behavior, one. Two, coming to your point about the Delhi government, in fact, the chief minister, Arvind Kejriwal, personally said, I mean, he made the, he said, I will visit, I will receive the farmers at the borders of Delhi. And he said, the Delhi government will help with arrangements of food, water, and toilets. So you also do have a government here, the host government in the capital city of Delhi. His attitude was entirely refreshing. Even if this government has been hamstrung or yeah. constrained badly but, because of the union yeah. government. Yes, but the attitude was totally refreshing in saying that they're coming to their capital city. All right. They are, our, you know, we will receive them. We okay. will... My last question to you before I conclude this part of our, my interview with you. What would be the political impact? What could be the political impact? Did the march of the 40,000 farmers or the 50,000 farmers in Maharashtra, could it have an impact on politics? Why do I ask this question? After 2014, the Congress became weaker than it's ever been before. The left became weaker than it's ever been before. Sure. And you mentioned Tripura earlier with a good track record in implementing the Manrega the government is gone. The left is in power only in Kerala. So the left movement has been weakened considerably. So I'm asking you, what impact, what kind of political impact do you foresee? The first thing that we see, and the lesson again was a lesson taught to us by the farmers of the Nashik Mumbai march, was the totally, by us, unforeseen impact on the consciousness of the urban middle classes. The impact on the, you know, last in, in May, in May, I spent two April, May, I spent three weeks in Punjab. I was then in Andhra Pradesh. All these come after the Nashik March, my tours. In far out places in Sangroor and Batinda, farmers had heard of the Nashik Mumbai March, were very proud that their counterparts could do it. And we're saying... And, and these are supposed to be quote-unquote wealthy farmers. This is supposed to be the agriculturally most prosperous part of India. Yeah. And they were saying, we should do this too. All right. We should go to Delhi. 
If, and they were all, by the way, the farmers who came from Nashik to Mumbai, they were the poorest of the farmers. They don't own food to air. Okay. okay. So, but I'm saying it caught the imagination. It caught the imagination of the farmer. Now, the protest with skulls at Jantar Mantar, that was really, for me, it was so sad because it was a tactic aimed at the media, which would otherwise not pay you attention. Right? So, that was the problem. But, but, everywhere I went, two things she had, had caught the attention of. In, in Chhattisgarh, in Sangroor, in Bhatinda, in Ludhiana, in Kakinada, in Mahabub Nagar, in Telangana, people knew two things. Swaminathan report, that has caught the imagination that, you know, that this is the big one that you have to get. Swaminathan report and tell us about the Nashik march. All right. We will wait and watch and see what happens. You mentioned the media. Let's talk a little bit about the media. But we conclude this part of our discussion. Thank you very much for giving us your time. This is the first part, the conclusion of the first part of the interview with Sainath, which examined the dimensions of the agrarian crisis in the country. Keep watching NewsClick and keep watching this YouTube channel for the next installment of this interview with Sainath, where we examine and we look at the current state of the media in India. Thank you for being with us.